Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to the tech edition of Strange Love Live. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. Hello. This week, we have out-of-towners on the show. Uh-oh. People not from our own home. People from Boise. We're joined by Chris Blanchard. Silicon Flores is from Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> and Wyatt Werner. Say, say hello. Greetings. Hello. Here we are. Glad there. to be here. Don't, don't oh. shout in the mic. Yay. I'm talking to Wyatt's mic. I think we're going to have a difficult time having a tech edition tonight. <laughs> I think we have a couple of wise guys on that? the couch. Or low tech. Wise or, guys? Or low tech. What about right wise guys over on the other side? Well, we do. We have a large studio oh, audience for us. Hello, everybody. Hello. We'll introduce... Hi. We'll give everyone a chance to introduce themselves during After Hours. How does that sound? But for now, let me just tell you that the Outsiders have brought a large studio audience. Everyone wants to peer at them like zoo animals. We bring, <laughs> we bring a crowd. Or welcome <laughs> them, maybe. Okay, maybe yeah. they want to welcome them to Portland. But, or peer you know. at them in like the zoo animals. I think it's the zoo animal thing. Let's take a vote. Zoo animals? <laughs> Or welcoming them. Um, yeah. Five, yeah. There you go. All right. Yeah. There you go. Welcoming right. anyone? Yeah. yeah we're, we're the only ones we're welcoming them. Zoo animals. All no, zoo price. animals. That's Most people like zoo animals, so it's yeah. okay. I like zoo animals. Yeah. They're yeah. nice as long as they, you know, keep their distance. Anyway, we're not here to talk about zoo animals. We're here to talk about you guys. It's everybody's That's favorite topic. <laughs> so That's why we, we have such a crowd. We know you guys. It's awesome. Because of the magic of Twitter. True. Is Twitter prominent in Boise in the Boise tech scene yes because the, the Boise tech scene is is limited in scope anyway so mm-hmm. um yeah it has a has a really good uh it has a pretty good penetrate well penetration for for the kind of crowd that it would reach in a larger venue so mm-hmm. I can't I can't yeah, I don't know anything like a percentage or anything like that but but no that has it I don't know I probably get five new Boise followers a day and I'm up to about 400 followers, which isn't great, but I mean, that's good Boise showing. I had one day, and it was one day where I was sitting there minding my own business on Twitter, and all of a sudden, like, follower after follower after follower after, and they were all from Boise, and I was like, did someone put up a Cami Chaos billboard in Boise <laughs> You're welcome. or something? You're welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was I think very that was, confused. Yeah. I was like, what, what is going on? The massive retweets. <laughs> yep, follow Cami Chaos. Oh yeah. yes, and I just didn't see them. They're like sheep. They're like sheeple. Is that what they? Sheep- yeah, sheeple. Yeah. Oh my god. Follow Cami Chaos. All right. Bosh. So you won't be returning home to Boise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's. They love us. Let's talk about Fernandos. We'll, we'll be greeted with rose petals. Right. Did I say it right? You did. As liberators. I'm so excited when I said it right earlier. I was terrified that I would then say it wrong later. No, that's it. Okay, let's talk about Fernandos. You tell us about it, and you tell us about the transition that it's making. Where do we begin? Just tell us what it is. So when I was a undergraduate student, actually, I published a paper uh, with one of my college professors. And uh, as anybody that's ever tried to do this, which I don't know, there's probably some people listening who've tried to do it. It's a really cumbersome process to try to get an academic paper published. So it takes years and years and years and years. Well, being a trained webmaster, I figured, you know, there's a simple way to do this. You just convert the whole thing over to the web. So uh, the concept for Pernetos was we would start a social networking community that uh, where scholars could come and network with each other and collaborate on works and uh, eventually publish their own works without the hassle of having to go through the cumbersome process of dealing with a regular publisher. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're quickly achieving that with uh, some open source tools and uh, with the help of actually one of our partners here uh, that came to visit us in the room from the open source crowd that actually built our website for us. Fantastic. And now there's a transition that's going to be happening. Right. The uh, The tough thing was is that uh, in the process of setting the whole thing up, we had, um, when we started rolling out our vision to people, customers started coming to us and saying, well, you know, do you guys think you could do this for us? And we looked at each other and went, well, yes, we could. You know, it's just <laughs> like, yeah, whatever we can do to try to monetize this right away. So um, in the process of putting all the pieces together that we needed to get our business plan rolling, uh, we realized there were some things we could do in the middle, um, like submission management uh, and whatnot that people would pay for right away. So mm-hmm. uh, we're actually uh, in the process of kind of separating some of the things out so the social network will be standing alone and then we'll actually have um, – 
what we're going to call an open access press, where we help um, publishers who are already doing a print publication of an academic journal, uh, helping them convert that over to a digital journal. So uh, it's something that right now is seen as a big cost cutting measure. It, it costs thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to produce a print journal, and you can do it electronically, of course, for far less money. So uh, with the economy right now, uh, the way it is, uh, higher education institutions are losing uh, budget money. So this is a great way for them to cut costs and still get their scholarship uh, out there. And, and we've been serving small academic journals. So... Um, Historical societies, local historical societies, mm -hmm. who publish once or twice a year, maybe maybe quarterly at the most. Those are the people who have they spend thirty thousand dollars a year to pr to produce these one or two journals a year. Yeah, and that's that's pretty absurd when they can do it for you know a fraction of the cost through open access. And then those who still want an actual printed medium in their hand, mm -hmm. that's the service that that's the service we provide. So you're doing both. We do both. Yeah. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. it's is it. Um, I'm trying to, to find the right word, but is it the on-demand printing? Right, print on demand. Print yeah, on so, demand, yeah. Yeah, what you find is that what journal publishers would do is they use the old traditional model where they'll go out and print a thousand copies and then hope they sell them. Well, mm -hmm. that, that costs a lot of money to do that when, of course, all you have to do is lay the publication out with common tools anybody's using today, create a PDF that can get sent to any one of the on-demand publishers today, like Lulu, Amazon.com has their own. There's any number of them out there that do this now. So all you basically have to do is create the PDF, and then if somebody wants to subscribe to it, they just click on it. And, of course, you don't print it until you know you get the money in hand. Yeah. So uh, much better business model, much more effective uh, for somebody who still wants to get their scholarship out there but really contain costs. So let me ask you, in a somewhat related um, area, there's a lot more of the on-demand publishing happening now, not just with you know people's poetry books and I've written the angsty poetry I'm very guilty of the writing of the angsty poetry I have volumes and volumes of it I've just never published it after tonight you probably have much more fodder for your yeah I guess. exactly <laughs> oh what was me um but do you think that the future of publishing lies in that direction you want to shoot at that one first um yeah in the digital medium you mean mm -hmm. yeah it, um sure yes <laughs> Short answer is yes. We talked about this a lot Make today. It a yeah. long answer. With, uh, with uh, I, I just finished reading probably like everybody else on the on the plane to and fro. I've been in three states in the last three days. Um, Seth Godin's new book, Tribes, mm -hmm. and uh, the premise of the book, if anybody hasn't read it, is that uh, if there's something that you're passionate about, there's probably a whole group of people out there uh, that are passionate about the same thing that you are. And with the digital tools today, it's so much easier. Uh, to create a leadership position for yourself with all these people who are, are waiting to be led, basically. And, the and, sheeple? You know, the sheeple, like our, all of our <laughs> sheeple in Boise. Yeah, right. Um, so, you know, the point being, when you look at the... <laughs> I think I'm losing my part. <laughs> um, so, especially when you think about academe now, um, there's a lot of professors who are, you know, brand names. I mean, these, these are guys with massive credibility, or gals with massive credibility in their field. And um, so, for instance, today I was at Portland State visiting with um, one of the real titans of um, history. So if, if you guys don't know here, we have a professor named Carl Abbott here at Portland State, one of the most foremost uh, urban historians uh, in the world. So, I mean, this is a guy that... If he wants to publish a book, he doesn't need to go to Houghton Mifflin. He doesn't need to go to McGraw Hill. He's Carl Abbott. All he has to do is is publish the book, and it will yes. people will buy it, and it will be popular. So th there's people like this all over the world that don't necessarily need the uh, the auspices of these big publishers to stand in the way of what they want of what they want to get done. So I think more and more and more and more. And Seth Godin is another one of these guys. I mean, I, why Seth continues to publish with a big publisher, I don't know. I mean, he can roll out whatever he wants to roll out and it'll mm -hmm. be New York, a New York Times bestseller. So I think with the, the medium today um, and following Godin's logic, I mean, there's gonna be lots and lots of people that will be able to roll out whatever they wanna roll out without, mm -hmm. without the middleman of, of the big publisher giving credibility to their work. So. You know, people like Carl Abbott, people like Seth Godin, they don't need McGraw-Hill to put a stamp of credibility on what they do. I think that my question was poorly phrased and that credibility really comes into it. Um, I, I, I like to use that word. I think it's a really good 
the good point is that you can now have credibility. That's kind of where yeah. can you is that the future of everything? Can everyone, not every single person, but can every field then gain credibility without the uh, endorsement of a major publisher? Well, and uh, you know, you talk about if if um, if we think that electronic media is the way that's going. Well, what we what we believe more than that is that open access is the medium that's going mm -hmm. on. So currently, the model is if you want to submit a paper, if you want to publish a paper, you have to submit it to a publisher and immediately relinquish all of your copyright control. Suddenly, you don't own your <laughs> own content terrible. anymore. Correct. Yeah, and it, they may not even publish it, but you don't own it anymore. They do, and the open access model uses creative, uh, we, you know, use cre uses creative commons licensing, so it's just attribution. Mm -hmm. So you get, so authors get wider distribution, knowledge gets spread faster, mm -hmm. and more widely, um, and for free to both the one who's being published and to those who would read their publication, and it's it's a it's a dissemination of, of knowledge. Is this is this purely a uh, is this a purely electronic publishing? So how the um, like devices like the Kindle, your laptop, your iPhone, your iPod, um, is this are these distribution methods where I can get this material? Because when we all you know when we go to college back in the old days, right? <laughs> when you had that big bag of heavy damn books, especially if you were studying any history or philosophy or sure. anything like that. Sure. Hey, that's, you know. <laughs> how did you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That damn Google again. <laughs> but I mean, is, is that is that possible? No, I think that was a self-experience. <laughs> oh, I mean, everyone's carrying a laptop now. And, you know, you got the Kindles kind of coming along. I mean, do you have pieces plugged in for pure electronic distribution? That's the, that's the model that we went to because um, one of the things we like to say in the early days is that one of the... Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on the biggest company in the world. But one of the most useless products in the world out there right now is Google Scholar. I don't uh, even know what that is. Right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Thank there you, you go. So, uh, I recognize they just, Google. They just announced a book search, public domain book search today, didn't they? Yeah, and boy, they that's just... a whole nother. Yeah, so the idea behind Google Scholar for them is that um, you can enter the name of a scholar you're looking for, and it will pull up um, – the, all the scholars' works there in Google that it can find, but but the difference between there's a big difference between something that can be found and something that can be accessed. Mm -hmm. So this this is the problem: is that um, okay? Well, I can I can easily go into Google and I can type in Nate Angel and see all the papers he's published. But then I click on it uh, on the link and it says, oh well, this is in a, this is in a private database that you don't have a subscription to. Yeah. So this is the nature of scholarship today: is that uh, again what Wyatt mentioned is. When you submit a paper, uh, the first thing you do is relinquish your copyrights, which means Sage or Hayworth or whoever it is is going to lock it away in a private database that they, uh, you know, sell for buku bucks to libraries. Mm -hmm. So, and everything you're doing to clarify is under Creative Commons, right? Yeah, it's correct. all open okay. access, so that when yeah, when when something, uh, so the first journal that we're going to release is uh, is one for the Idaho uh, State Historical Society. Idaho Yesterday has been published for 51 years. And so now we're going to turn that into an open access online journal with a print on demand component. So uh, everything that is released under that will be you know, Creative Commons, digitally available, downloadable for free, no gatekeeper. So is the author, is the scholar, are they making money uh, by the print on demand piece? Scholars or? don't don't make money, and that's not why they do it. Scholars <laughs> scholars do it. Well, for, I don't know that. Yep. See, Russian is, history professor at PSU that twenty five years ago was making some money off his class. It well, was his books I was buying off of, off of books, but not off of journal articles. So right. the kind of the the coin of the realm, the mm -hmm, phrase they mm -hmm, use is mm -hmm. journal articles. So the way that you advance in your career is by um, authoring articles that get placed in well-respected journals, and that's how your career advances. So, um, and then once you get the credibility, then you write the books so that you make it, all your students buy. So is right. this almost like the death of textbooks, so to speak? I mean, is Boy, this a this new is model another, of education? The, the, well, that is another... Uh, What's the boy, point of a textbook at, at that point? The, I, think there, I think we're going to get to that. That years down the road, as more as more content is, is freely available, and you start, you're, we're starting to see textbook manufacturers um, offer this up now to uh, to try to mitigate this wave of open access content that's available now. So you've got all the big publishers saying, 
well, hey, you know, if you want to cobble together a textbook from the best of everything we have available, fine, we'll let you, we'll let you go ahead and do that. But again, that's far different from what we're what we're doing and what other people are doing. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think what what Google wants to do and, and other people want to do is, uh, yeah, just if it's scholarship, it wasn't created to make money. It was created to advance knowledge. I mean, that's sure. the whole goal of the scholar. So uh, the open access model is really the wave. And I think scholar uh, the uh, old time scholarly publishers are really doing everything they can to try to mitigate that. But it, it, it's not going to last forever. So. Hmm. They're trying to make their catalogs more open and available so that content can be remixed, but it's really right. not not in the same spirit that the open access movement is, right. is you, doing. You still have to pay copyright licensing for each piece of material. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, how about other medium? I mean, it, it, you know, we're talking about the printed word, um, audio, audio books, iPod. Is that also something you're you're looking at as far as well, converting te text to to audio? I mean, you know. The platform that we're using enables uh, video and audio okay. em embedding. So yeah, you do bring up the the delivery model is really cool. Yeah. So whether you're, so if we put together a journal uh, electronically, it's much different than a print journal. So yeah, imagine if you could open a National Geographic and there could be, you know, a video of the shark eating the you know the the, the pelican or whatever it is that's out there. You know, and that kind of stuff. Well, we can do that with with a digital journal. You know, we can you can you know read the article of the professor's written we can link video we Tie can embed the video in. right in there yeah we can yeah, yeah so we, we yeah you can do all that electronically so it's a, it's a, it's a much richer experience it's still again at a much lower cost than you would get with just Absolutely. the printed medium yeah and it's already happening you have you have MIT that's released all its course where right. you have right. iTunes U i mean right. it's 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 already being done gotcha gotcha so um did you have a yeah i was actually just wondering it kind of brings us off the topic a little bit but um, was Pernodus kind of your link to the tech community in Boise, or were you guys pretty much ingrained in that already? Because you are both on the board for Ignite Boise, correct? There you go. That's your. <laughs> that's that's why it's baby. That. Uh... Well, to answer your first question, yeah, I think that was kind of our our, our breach into the the mm -hmm. tech community. Idaho. You know, we we uh, we first started uh, some web development with a with a, with a small Idaho startup. Um, and that's how we kind of started the relationships that led us to you know, just kind of you know build build yeah. a build a tech community network. Yeah. And so the ignite the ignite Boise um, uh, startup or yeah the ignite Boise project we just looked at ignite Portland frankly and said damn that's really cool and we're ripe for it we could really we could pull that off and 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 get some fresh ideas out there without any motive or agenda other than just sharing ideas and having a good time. And uh, it's. The Ignite Boise's March nineteenth. March nineteenth, Thursday. Be there. Everyone, be there. <laughs> I'm the only person Everybody. who yeah. has offered a good excuse. <laughs> That's right. It's All true. the rest of you have to go because Dr. Normal and I will not be in attendance. That's Aaron right. Hopper, but be there, Aaron. Make sure you tell <laughs> me when the July one is. Bring Rick. Okay. Bring Rick. Um. Yes. We, what? And we is had there a, a similar question? experience too. With. Uh, go ahead. I want to. Yeah. I just. Uh, Do we have a question? Um, from the, the peanut gallery? In the peanut gallery. I don't know. Well, this is uh, Nate Angel, also known as Hello And I'm wondering um, if you guys... I can't, I can't say it like that. <coughs> Strange. Oh. <laughs> if you guys... I save it for after hours. <laughs> How do you Post think tech. of the relationship between um, Boise and your experience there in the tech scene and the Portland tech scene? Do you see it? Is there, is there an interrelated community going on there? Or is it um, is it merely just two kind of sibling cities next to each other that are growing up semi independently? We sure hope there's an intermingling going on. You know, like um, like I said, we began our web development with a Boise firm, and later went to Open Sorcery, which is who delivered just this fantastic product for us, based in Portland, of course. And um, and uh, you know, I'm uh, I don't know if it's relevant, but <laughs> I, you know, I'm going doing my MBA over at Portland State instead of at Boise State, and you know, part of the letter I wrote to the admissions officer was, Portland's doing correct things. It's doing it right. It's, it was. It has not always been what it is as far as being a tech center or, or just the booming economy that it now is. And we are clearly not there. But we were. Or I'm sorry, Portland was similar to the way Boise is now. And if we can, you know, incorporate steps that that Portland's taken and maybe develop some sort of mentorship relationship. Absolutely, we'd love. You know, we've we, we've talked many times about intermingling 
more deeply the tech community in Portland with the tech community in Boise. Does that mean that Boise is going to be getting a beer and blog soon? Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> now that you say that. We should do I a don't beer. Know, that's a great we, idea. We should do a beer and blog. We're, we we do a lot of tweet ups over there. That mm -hmm. is uh, that's kind of our that's kind of our version. But yeah, I'm starting to see I think more uh, it seems to me more serious linkages, uh, which is, Boise is difficult because we are the largest city of uh, the most isolated city of our size mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, which is kind of interesting to think about. So uh, it's difficult uh, when you're in Portland, you have that the concept of the Cascadia region where um, you're, you know, kind of. We have suburbs. Portland, yeah, Portland is well. Portland is connected to Vancouver, is connected yeah. to Seattle, is connected to San Francisco, and we uh, Boise really doesn't have that linkage anywhere. I, I think Nampa we. Nampa and Caldwell. Yeah, right. We've got yeah, we've got Nampa Caldwell. So Rick is speaking a foreign language. That's right. <laughs> Rick is from Idaho. Uh, so we, but it's very difficult. I think we have a shared culture with Salt Lake and that area a little bit more, but still, mm -hmm. you know, we're six hours. From, six hours, yeah. Yeah, from Salt Lake, so and we're eight hours from Portland, but I think. Um, it seems to me that there's been a pretty good effort and there has been, when you look at statistics in, in Boise, the inflow and outflow, the number one city is always Portland. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are starting to become a lot of linkages between Portland and Boise, I think, uh, professionally and socially. And so I think, I think we're seeing a lot more of that. I don't, I don't think White and I are anomalies at all. I, th I think it's, uh, it, it's probably occurring quite a bit more now. So... Is, um, I meant that in the literal sense, not the. <laughs> yeah, if only we could see. Could if only we had more cameras and you could see the faces that Nate is making. If only. If only. Um, so my question is: in Portland, it, you know, where we used to have a very isolated tech community, uh, it's now a very, very social community. People are no longer just sitting behind their computers, by themselves. You know, with their ramen noodles, they're out together. There's tweet ups there's beer and blog like don't make me bring up community gardens okay i will if i have to but i was just thinking of you know a new ignite promotion ramen noodles for everyone hey that was a great <laughs> that was, was a great was, talk we ramen? had it we had we it had was. a what was the name of the talk a ramen noodle bar instead cup of, of noodle yeah. soup instead well, of no what bar? was the exact does anyone remember the title was, was it of, it was just a cup of noodles cup, at greg's I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Cup of noodle soup. Griggs did a fantastic Ignite presentation about the science behind the cup of noodle. And it was it was at the first Ignite that I was at, and it was a fantastic presentation. It was really... And he gave it a gnome dex. Yeah. Too. Then yeah. he did it, yeah, yeah gnome nice. dex as well. well when so. we had our... Uh, when we had the the first planning meeting for Ignite Boise, one of the, mm -hmm. that was one of the things we brought up is we looked at uh, Ignite Portland, and somebody asked... Remember who it was Jeff or somebody asked, uh, you know, well, God, look at they're on, like, you know, they're on like uh, IP five or something now, you know. How IP five is is uh, two weeks yeah, from two yesterday. Weeks, yeah. And and uh, and we, you know, and you look at the numbers, and I don't know what you guys sold out seven hundred and fifty or something like that last time, and there were still people on the way. I mean, it was it was yeah. a huge success. Anyways, this time it was five minutes and thirty seconds, and yeah. it was 529. oh five twenty nine, five twenty nine, and it was uh. 560 yeah 560 yeah. tickets yeah and so the, you know i'm really glad that i'm a sponsor so i didn't have to nice that's right <laughs> i think that's how we got that. in we will be a sponsor this time yes. around Better oh yes we're sponsoring damn video put together quickly <laughs> we need to get our sponsor video put together yeah. we're sponsoring yeah. so that we don't have to we get tickets we're supposed to i think uh, yeah, i know we, we, well, we probably will yeah pernetos will sponsor but uh oh, I the think portland one that too. We or that. That's your point. Yeah. We're, We're really being that. put on the spot. Huh? Yeah. Did you bring your checkbook? That's right. No, it's been a lot. No. Of fun. Thank yeah. you for having. Bang. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want us to write you a check, huh? All right. Sure. There's a lot of Portland sure. people in this room, and we're gonna roll you before. Yeah. You when know. has oh, yeah. has the deadline for submissions already passed? No, we actually did it backwards the first time. We actually put tickets out before we put submissions out. I know. Oh my gosh, you guys are crazy! I know, it, and that's kind of what we ran into. You know, we, we, well, the first thing we were really, we were really thrilled and a little bit big-headed once we saw that we'd sold out 200 seats in three days, and mm -hmm. then we saw that Portland sells 500 seats in about two hours, and that yeah. Yeah, no, this time it was it was five minutes and 29 seconds. Is that? Oh, that's what you. Oh, that's what you. Meant. That's embarrassing. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> hey, this is our first go. And we're yeah. Both you so, guys are doing so it, was, it was. It was. Easy. Oh. Jeez. Cricket, it's on a cracker. I didn't like that noise. I'm just gonna hold still. <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> it was easier to create buzz by putting. Okay. Whoa.
Okay, Dr. Normal. We'll just keep going. Because it because putting putting tickets out, signing up for <laughs> give me that mic. Give me the mic, Nate. Oh we finally feel yeah, we finally realized it was Nate. Uh you, you you can hear me. I can hear myself, so I'm sure everyone can yeah. hear me. So Signing up for tickets was a lower barrier for adoption and promotion and, and creating buzz than was. Man, you really are an MBA school. Get, getting getting people Holy to cow. <laughs> getting people to um, you know to submit a presentation about they don't really know what yet. Mm -hmm. So Ignite Boise two, which we hope will be in July, mm -hmm. uh, is we will do the submissions first because people will know what it is. We, the, 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 absolutely, the primary question we get. And I'm sure you all experienced the same thing was. What is Ignite? I don't, I don't understand it. Is it a? Is it a? I answer that question a lot. Yeah. Well, how how do you mm -hmm. answer it? I mean, I've found a number of ways to answer it, but what, what what's? Um, it depends on who I'm speaking to. Mm -hmm. If I'm talking to someone who's not in the tech community that I know from some other source, I usually tell them that it's a, a big tech social mm -hmm. where people get together and talk about their other passions, and they have five minutes to stand on the stage in front of the Baghdad. Sure. And uh, the slides auto advance. Yeah. And they can talk about whatever they want to as long as they were chosen. Okay. And then they ask what I talked about, and I try I to just explain read it. The, and, yeah. I just read off the website because I figure the PR guys that put it together knew what they were talking about. Yeah. What does the website say? Imagine if you had five minutes and 20 slides to talk about whatever you wanted. That's pretty much what I said, yeah. yeah. Bam! <laughs> that ended up being the tagline on, Marketing on our site. Was 20 yeah. slides, five minutes, what would you say? Yeah. That, so that, that's pretty simple. Do that's you have no saying. submissions yet? or? No, we have we have like under 10, though. Mm -hmm. And we're aiming for 16, so. Yeah, that'll that'll fill in really quickly. Yeah, we, we have we have about, we probably have a dozen, at least a dozen people we know of saying, I'm still working on it. You should just try to see if you can get someone that did a Portland presentation to come and, and redo theirs. It'd be really cool if... if Thanks, Rick. Rick. Yeah, if, we'll if, take if, it. If, if Rick Tarazi would come out, that'd be really sweet. Uh, I don't think I Rick, never Rick's never presented. <laughs> Rick doesn't like to get on stage. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to have... <laughs> call I do call call I don't, Nate, you've never <laughs> presented either, have you? What? No. no I, Sorry. Shame. You know, people would ask me what, what Ignite was, and I used to call it an idea barf, <laughs> and that didn't go terribly well, so no. I kind of abandoned that language. <laughs> that's for after hours. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> it's, it's, whatever it is, it's honest. It's true. That's what I call that it. That was kind of my presentation, so that's okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm willing to admit that. It was an idea barf with underwear. It was yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, with uh, okay, well. Oh, yeah. If you guys haven't seen my presentation... <laughs> Yeah, you've missed out. God, you're getting like a year of mileage on this podcast on that one presentation. It's just uh, like every week it's underwear and underwear? cleavage, you know? I didn't even mention the cleavage. Yeah. I did not mention the Why cleavage not? or the shoe baby well, or the, the yeah. ice cream. You, nobody cares about the ice cream. It was with the cleavage. We're really starting to get into after hours. Yeah, yeah exactly. We need to, we we need to stop. Yeah. But you know what? It's it's perfect timing because it's time to drift into after hours. That's, That's right. Wow. I did ha yeah. No, I'll save it for after save hours. Save it for after hours. So. Although what I'm about to say is after hours territory as well. I'm so glad that you all could join us. I'm so glad that you guys were here. Me too. It's Please fantastic. join us next week for the sex episode too. Oh, my God. Are we on that one? No. No, you'll be okay. <laughs> I was like, what, was this sex episode one? Because <laughs> wasn't that a great lead out for tech? It's like we'll be joined by Miss Burroughs, Melissa Lyon, and uh, oh, Cammie Kaviton. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. How could we have missed that? <laughs> and, a, and apparently there might be pajamas. I, I don't know. We'll have to confirm that We have that some later. continuity issues on the show right now. Hard tech and sex. <laughs> there Thank will be no much. tech episode next week. It will all be pajamas. No tech? Oh, all right. Well, I guess we could have sex tech. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Good night, everybody. Uh, good Thanks night. for joining us. <laughs>